We are going to go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, this is the ASMP panel on photography and AI. Uh, I'm Ben Coe. I'm a photographer, a member of ASMP, and tonight I'm also your moderator. Uh, this evening, we are going to try to cram in a lot of stuff in one hour. Uh, so tonight, tonight, here's what we're doing. Uh, we're doing an overview of AI image generation, and then we're going to talk about what it can do, uh, what it's like to use, how we think it's going to impact our industry. And we're going to just show and discuss examples of uh, photographers, agencies, uh, clients who are currently using uh, AI in their work. And then we're going to ask some uh, tough questions to ASMP Chief Legal Counsel uh, Tom Madry, who's going to give us uh, the lay of the land uh, currently with uh, regards to IP issues uh, with uh, uh, both for ourselves and the technology companies. And then we're going to discuss really what we need to do to be ready, because, you know, spoiler alert, you know, the AI image revolution is already here. So to help explore these topics, we have a panel of talented photographers and legal minds, and I'm going to ask them now to um, introduce themselves, uh, starting with uh, Caitlin. Hi, uh, I'm Caitlin Kinney. I work in conceptual photography. Um, I do a lot of compositing, so AI is kind of a natural next step for me. Uh, based in Indianapolis, freelance. Um, yeah, so just kind of shooting a lot of remote stuff these days for clients. Uh, Weston? Um, my name is Weston Fuller. I'm a professional photographer, mostly commercial, do some fine art, based in San Diego, California. Uh, like Caitlin, I'm a conceptual a uh, photographer, a lot of uh, live in Photoshop. Most of my images are photo based, but I do already use CGI, which has been around for a while. So uh, definitely integrating AI into my work already. All right, uh, Terry. Uh, my name is Terry Campbell. I'm a commercial food and drink photographer and director. So most of my work is not the conceptual kind of stuff. I do a lot of Photoshop, but it's because food isn't perfect. You know, we end up touching a lot of things up, but most of my work is probably 50% packaging and 50% point of purchase. Think venues or things like that, packaging that you see in the store. Um, so that's that's the majority of my work. And I've been in the AI space probably for about six, eight months now, kind of got into it last fall and have just tried. Um, I immediately saw some opportunities to use in my work and I've tried to just incorporate it into the things I'm already doing. Great. Thank you, Terry. And Tom. Yeah, my name is Tom Madry. I'm ASMP's chief legal officer and head of national content and education. Um, just like uh, all of you, uh, I have been getting many, many questions about AI and its implications, and it actually raises a whole host of copyright issues and lawsuits and uh, things photographers should be thinking of and things you should be informing your clients of. So hopefully we'll talk about some of those tonight. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we, before we dive in, um, just a couple instructions. Uh, first of all, uh, if you look at your Zoom panel, you'll see a Q&A um, option. So as we're uh, talking, if you have questions for the panelists, uh, type your question into Q&A, and um, as soon as we can get to it, uh, we'll fit that into the conversation. And also, if you actually want to address the panelists yourself, when you type in the question, uh, just say OK in parens next to it, meaning it's okay for me to actually go ahead and enable your mic and camera and you can speak to the panelists directly. And if you don't say, okay, I'm assuming that you don't want to be on camera and I, I will read your question for you instead. Does that make sense everybody? Okay. So uh, uh, secondly, uh, also look in your Zoom uh, panel, you'll see something called reactions. Uh, if you click on reactions, um, the key thing I want you to notice for the moment is where it says raise hand. And I just want to actually use that for a second to take a quick poll. So right now we've got 43 people logged in. Um, so click on reactions, look where it says raise hand. And if you are currently using AI um, image generating software in your workflow in some way, can you uh, click raise hand? I just want to see how many people are. 
All right, so we got about about five people. Six, okay, all right, so uh, a certain amount. All right, and then uh, my next question is, how many of you have, okay, so go, go ahead and lower your hands. How many of you have actually tried the uh, AI image generating software? Okay, so roughly about the same. Okay, so that's good. So we've got, a, that means that we've got a lot of new content for a lot of the attendees, which was, which is our goal. Great. All right, so the first thing we're going to start off with before we dive into the discussion is we're going to do just kind of a level set on uh, how AI image generation software works. And to do that, I'm going to do a little screen share. All right. So with today's AI, you can start with some text to describe the image. For example, portrait of black females, uh, color photograph, red clothing and the AI will generate it. Or instead of starting with text, you can start with an image and then add some text, kitten wearing hat. And then the AI will use the text to edit the image. You can even start with one image, add another image and the AI will combine them. You can give it a really long art direction with focal length, aspect ratio, poses, emotion, casting, happy teenage student in classroom, flipping desk into the air while joyful teenage students and teachers cheer, et cetera, et cetera. And we can feed that to an AI and it might give us something like this. Now notice I didn't get everything right there. Um, I don't see any disks, desks flipping in the air, but it got a lot of things right. And let's, let's say that you have an image and your client says, get rid of that statuette, uh, show more of my body and add a dog. Well, AI can let you do, help you do that too. So here, up here, we're changing the prompt to say, holding cute puppy. Then we're selecting uh, an eraser that's doing what uh, it's called in painting, which is basically masking. And that selection that we've in-painted is gonna be replaced by the text description of holding cute puppy. So it gives us a few examples, multiple choices of dogs and poses and got rid of the statuette. So in summary, what is an, what is an image generator, an AI image generator? It's software that uses artificial intelligence to generate new images from text and image prompts. So we basically learned that you can do text to image, image to image, image plus text to image, and image, image plus image to image. It also does in painting, which is basically like masking. And it does some, what it calls out painting, uh, which is basically like uh, Photoshop's uh, content to wear fill, except much more powerful. And the three AI uh, platforms that are very popular right now, one is called Stable Diffusion. And this is what that looks like. One is called Midjourney. And this is what that looks like. And one is called Dolly 2. And this is what that looks like. All right. And that is our overview of AI image generating software. So we'll use that to kick off our discussions. Panelists, what do you think? I mean, Terry, I have my... do you want to jump in? <laughs> We're all jumping in at once. I, I was just going to say, I'm excited. I'm... And you're excited because? Just the possibilities, you know, the world that's opened up to us, the world that now we, the things we can create, the things we can do. It's just, 
it's incredible to think about it and to to explore it and you know i feel like i'm a kid in a dark room watching these images come up again it's just it's taking me back to when i got my first camera awesome awesome yeah i'm All excited right. i also feel a lot of pressure to make sure that i'm staying ahead of what anybody else is doing with it or at least up to date with what everybody else is doing with it um it seems like it's going to go so much faster than I anticipate it going so much faster than any other development that's happened in our particular industry. Um, that is just like, wow, we need to hold on fast and, and stay alert with everything because there's going to be a lot of developments with it. So yeah, a lot of pressure and excitement. Okay. All right. I think I'm maybe for myself, I get caught up. Uh, I started using this last fall, like Terry said, he, uh, when he started in there's a lot of possibilities. I'm still kind of stuck in the how phase, like how things are generated. And um, you can kind of get, you can kind of go down a rabbit hole because as you saw, you know, you wanted to show a student flipping over a desk. AI does not really, you know, it's not going to get everything perfect. And I think, you know, I get, I get hung up on that. My work is, is really geared to kind of a, a perfectionist side where I want to be able to change things a little bit here and there and have full control over the image and that's like my own frustration I have with AI right now is even though I'm trying to implement it, I'm putting in prompts, I'm putting in text, using images, and then I'm just waiting for it to regurgitate something out to me. And it's like not, I don't feel like I have the control. It's not me creating it. And so it has the limitations and I'm, you know, I'm implementing those where I can with, with how it can be successful for me, but not without me losing my own touch on the image. Right, okay. right. To totally understand. Can I? Jump uh, there is there? a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dave. Yes. All right. I just want to say I I've struggled the same thing because a lot of my work I tend to be very much perfectionist and I want control and I want to you know I'm a studio photographer I don't do location for that reason because I want control and I've really had to just let go of a lot of things with this and I you know I don't try to finesse the image too far I just go that's good enough you know it's it's um, Caitlin if we were talking before you know that these these are like the 3.2 megapixel camera we're not going to show these images to anybody in five years so right now we're just learning and I've just I've really had to give myself a lot of leadway and it's been hard, but just letting go has been so freeing too to, to explore and try things. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to hear from, I'd love to hear from like the, at least the participants with the same kind of reaction that you did earlier, Ben, like with just that quick brief overview, like how many, how many minds were just blown with like being able to add images and change images because my first experience, I was just sitting back and just being like, what is this thing doing? Like, this is just pumping out images and in a matter of minutes that would take me. I mean, the longest image I think I ever created, it was, it was like a 40 hour image. And so like, it changed my world dramatically in an afternoon. That's good. That's, that, that's a good point. Uh, so for thanks, those thanks who Lindsay have- for me, I'm going to just call Lindsay out and say, thanks, Lindsay, for being honest and saying your mind just got blown because uh, it, it's, it's completely amazing what, what the possibilities are. Excellent. Yep. So uh, we have a, one attendee who asked a question already. <laughs> Wait a minute. I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> Is that I mean, I, I appreciate I appreciate the kudos uh, on, on the, the good looking <laughs> set. Uh, these guys uh, are all out there working, actually doing stuff. I sit here all day and, and talk. So uh, that's why. We, think, we give our money to Tom. <laughs> to represent him. so that's why his his set looks so good so that's right my money's not spent on my office <laughs> uh so there are a couple Lindsay questions asked, actually in the yeah Lindsay asked what program do each yes, of us yes. use um exactly. i'm pretty much exclusively in mid journey right now i did use dolly for a small section of a client um job the other day uh they had a a gif that already existed that somebody else shot and created but it was landscape format. Um, and she was wanting me to turn it into a real format for Instagram and use AI to do so. Um, so I used Dolly to outpaint to get some sort of something up at the top and at the bottom. And it wasn't perfect. Um, I don't think Dolly's quality is as good, but for it to be building off of the existing image saves me a lot of time to blend between elements. 
Um, and I knew I was going to use mid journey to create separate elements to then kind of plop on top of the top and the bottom that are, we're going to be moving to keep the gift movement happening. Um, so that's the only time I've used Dolly so far outside of just kind of experimenting with myself. But for, in my opinion, mid journey is far and beyond the best quality looking for images. So that's why I've been sticking in that. Okay. I'm the uh, same way. I'm with mid journey. So mid journey is 90% of what I've done. I've done a little bit with uh, Dolly. When I started to try to get really specific on the things I wanted changed, I was using Dolly because you can't outpaint. But um, it was, I found that the more I wanted to be more technical with it, it wasn't giving me the results I wanted. So then I just decided to be more general and I stuck with mid journey where the quality was was the leading push for me. In, in okay. offer, in, I'm, I'm mid journey, um, mostly because it's got an unlimited plan. <laughs> hey, 30 bucks a month and just go. Uh, I started with stable diffusion and I liked that, but I realized I was eating through money really fast. And so I went to mid journey because I'm like, I just need to learn. I just need to repeat the prompts, try different things. And so I was able to do that mid journey. I tried Dolly too the other day um, because again, I needed the outpainting feature. And um, I, I liked that, but I I did do some prompts while I was there and I wasn't as impressed. I think mid journey just is really geared right now. It's, it's the lead horse, but um, I think they all have a different place and, and different, you know, use cases for all of them. Definitely. Well, mid journey is one other thing to point about mid journey. Um, their goal, I think is maybe different from Dolly's and stable uh, diffusion. I mean, their goal is to empower everyday people to generate really imaginative art. So, um, Terry, this is something you and I chatted about earlier. If we sort of compare uh, these different AI generating platforms to cameras, um, you know how we say, oh, certain cameras, oh, I really like the JPEGs that they create, or I like, you know, the, I like the color space that comes in the raw file. And this other camera, yeah, sure, it's raw and you can do anything in raw, but I really have to work it to get it where I want it to be. Uh, would you guys all agree that Mid Journey really tries hard to give you beautiful images? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's designed for that. Um, the, the other ones, I think they fail. They certainly fail the beauty test, but I, I think at the moment they're not trying to hit the beauty test. Um, I think they have a different goal. Um, Mid Journey is, in some ways, they're the only, so there's three. Mid Journey is um, right again aimed at the consumer and really aiming at empowering people to create beautiful art. Um, Dolly Two, Dolly Two is owned by OpenAI, which says Chat B, Chat GBT. Um, OpenAI's larger goal is artificial generalized intelligence, right? Super you know, AI. So I, I almost kind of, kind of feel like this is an exercise for them on the way to that. But they're not, you know, that's one department at OpenAI, whereas MidJourney, that's all they do is they're an imaging platform. Same thing with Stability. Stability does a lot of different things in AI. So um, Stable Diffusion is one piece of it. The one, the one thing to note uh, for attendees, uh, Stable Diffusion is, that makes Stable Diffusion very interesting is it's the only one that's open source. And the great thing about it being open source is you can actually download, download the source code and run it on your own system. I'm, I'm running it on my Mac right now. Um, and there are all these other developers out there in the world who are excited about it. And they're writing extensions um, that extend it beyond what Stability AI has, has done with it. Um, later, we're going to demo, uh, we're, we're going to show a clip of, a, of, of an animation that used uh, st uh, Stability Diffusion um, a, a specific extension that does animation. And, you know, that's beyond what MidJourney can do. That's beyond what Dolly can do. So there's a lot of things that the open platform um, provides. Um, so you should definitely keep your, keep your eyes on that. Uh, the other thing to say is, uh, I, I totally agree with everyone said about um, MidJourney definitely being more responsive and, and definitely giving you better results with less prompting. Um, I did read that uh, people who are uh, testing the latest version of Dolly uh, to say that it's it's better. Um, it's not at the mid journey level yet, but they said it's definitely better than uh, Dolly two. I, I don't know what the release date is. Brian, you're not wasting time with 3D and CG. Absolutely not, <laughs> um, and not in my opinion. Um, 
Yeah. My thoughts are I'm, I'm just for everyone else in the Q and a Brian was saying, I'm, I started investing more and more time and money learning CGI and incorporating it into my work. I'm currently using cinema 4d and redshift. Now I'm wondering if I'm wasting time with 3d and should instead be learning more about AI image generation instead thoughts. I just really don't like that. I can't take any copyright ownership. Um, I'm interested to hear what um, Tom has to say about copyright later on too. But for me, CG and AI are two totally different things. And I think they always will be. I think there can be certain plugins that are going to overlap with stuff. Because I mean, in some ways, we're already using tiny little bits of AI and Photoshop, even like with the content aware fill and everything. Um, I think AI is, it's going to be a while before you can get really, really specific to Weston's point about being a perfectionist and like having a very specific composition and idea and lighting and shadows and everything. I think it's going to be a while before um, AI does that. And a CG is just going to be a totally different thing, just like how it is right now. Like I'm a composite photographer, but I'm learning Blender right now, but I have clients that are like, oh, can we do this? And they show me you know, like a 3D CG scene. And I'm like, no, <laughs> like that's completely different from the Photoshop composite stuff that I'm doing. So I don't think you're wasting your time at all. If anything, I think maybe later on down the line, AI and CG will marry together into some sort of mega beast program, but you're going to need that, that CG knowledge first in order to really fully take advantage of it. So don't, don't stop learning that. Well, I mean, we're, in a, we're in an industry that everything is on progress, you know, all the tech, every tool that we use from your camera, you know, everything is progressing every year. There's a new, you know, there's a new update, there's a new model. Um, you know, I, I'm on shoots all the time with, uh, either my friends or others where you, you, everyone's probably are, you know, heard that, like, we'll fix it in Photoshop. Well, that, you know, that's kind of the world I live in, but I also have a lot of friends that, you know, they spend countless hours trying to get everything right in camera. And so, Photoshop came along, it allowed us to retouch, it allowed us to kind of alter the images that were being shot in camera. CGI allowed us to start uh, altering things, everything. You have to have a strong foundation in this industry with whatever tools that you're using. And I think AI is one of those tools. Um, but even the prompts that are being used in AI, you have to you have to know what those prompts are. When you're talking about an 8K, uh, 4K, you, when you're talking about cinema, cinematic lighting, if you don't have that understanding from the, the start of your photography or the start of like digital art, you don't know what those prompts mean unless you're just, you know, putting something out there because you're, you're copying somebody else's prompt. And I think that, you know, that gets back into the copyrights and usage, but it's just, it's, that's, to me, that's the scary part because that's, that's the unknown of like how this will affect all of our work that we have spent years creating the foundations of the tools that we've learned uh, to be able to provide us the ability to be able to create AI is just another one of those tools and, you know, that we can be able to start pulling from. It's really uh, interesting me, what me. you were saying about um, the vocabulary and like needing to know the vocabulary of these things for prompts, because I, the other day was trying to come up with something that looked a little bit more screen print E but I don't have experience in screen printing. So I was literally Googling terminology. Like, what does it, what's that called whenever like there's the color separation, like aberration, but in screen printing. So I was literally trying to look up like vernacular about screen printing in order to know how to input it into AI for AI to know what I was talking about. So like knowing your craft and knowing the vocabulary behind your craft is going to be the name of the game when it comes to text prompt AI. I one of the things I love that's, you know, if you want to start copying somebody's style, you you have to have some, you have to have some history or you have to have some knowledge in, you know, photo history. And so you can look back at some of the artists who have already created our industry. And if we want to re like look back on their styling of how we're already influenced and all of how we're all creating, you have to know that, you know, every time I'm doing a prompt, I'm using, you know, I love what I found that's being most successful for me when I do my prompts is making sure I put in like the, a th I want to use a 35 millimeter lens uh, as part of my prompt, or I want to use a 200 millimeter lens. Uh, and you need to be able to know like how that, how that lens looks in real life before you're trying to just create something that's generic on screen. Uh, let, let me jump in with a, a couple of questions. Um, sort of working backwards on the question of prompts. Um, what are what are the what are the panel's thoughts about uh, artist prompts? I know in um, other uh, other discussions, 
uh, mostly on the illustrator side, you know, there are a lot of artists who are concerned about people putting in their name and then being able to generate images that are, you know, similar in style to what they've done. Um, I've I've tried that out myself. Um, it definitely, it, from my experience, it works better with, you know, illustrators' work. It doesn't work as well with photographers' work, or maybe that's just because I have a sharp eye for photography, so I can see how flawed it is, and I don't have a sharp sharp eye for illustration, so I don't see it the flaws as much. But definitely, illustrators. Some illustrators have said, you know, they would like the uh, the platforms to basically filter out artist names or uh, allow them to opt their artist name out of the prompts. Um, so I just wondered what if anyone has any thoughts on that. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I think that it feels it feels weird to be able to specifically call out an artist's name, calling out an art like an artistic genre or a decade of style like Art Deco or something. That makes sense to me. But trying to mimic the exact style of another artist, I get I get why you know like this particular photographer has just this really great, great quality of light that I want to imbue in this image, but I don't want it to be, I'm not trying to copy this artist. I'm just trying to get their light. So I get it. I get the desire to, but I fully think that artists should be able to somehow have their name be on a blacklist that is not recognizable in AI if they want that. I mean, I think it's, that's where it gets a little bit iffy for me because I, you know, my educational background with uh, go, with art school was all you were to you were geared towards trying to create your own style. You were, you know, you had to kind of find your own way, and then it was like pounded into you that you needed to be able to show that, like you needed to find your own niche. You needed to carve yourself out. You needed to be recognizable for what you do. And my my, you know, one of my issues with AI is it generates something that's so generic that anybody could be doing it. Uh, mid journey is geared towards you know trending styles that are happening right now and so stuff that it's pumping out is you know very moody very dark it, it it's stuff that i if i wouldn't take something from mid journey and then just and ever share it because it doesn't have my touch on it like you don't see the touch of the artist's hand in any of the images that i would see from ai i think you can see styles from different artists and what they you know how they fit but to me, it just it would never produce something that I think I could say like, oh, this is a Weston Fuller image. So can I ask all of you and I'll, I, Terry, I'm going to start with you um, on the subject of styles. How how successful are you at imposing your style, uh, you know, your artistic will on the AIs or are you mostly getting sort of, you know, the components in there, right? And then you're having to pull it out and, you know, do additional work in Photoshop and other things in post. What, what What's your success rate in, you know, being able to maintain your style through the AI? Terry, can you start? Um, yeah, I think uh, I'm going to disagree with my federal panelists here, Weston, because <laughs> I do think that my style comes through in the AI work that I do um, because it's a product of my prompts and my, you know, deciding which images to move forward with, when to stop, when I've got it. It's it's me working through that process. And, you know, my wife was saying, like, it looks like your stuff. And I was like, yeah, I guess, you know, and and I, I it kind of did, but I wasn't really sure. And then when another artist friend of mine, a photographer, started using AI, you know, her work looked like her work. You know, she was using the same tool I was, but her work looked nothing like mine. It looked like Judy, you know, and my work looked like me. And so now I've really come to the, the idea that I do see, you know, the work, even on my Instagram feed, I'll mix in an AI image here and there. And it doesn't look like, oh, that's AI, that's AI, that's his regular stuff. It just, it all kind of flows. It all kind of looks like my work. So I do think that that style comes through and that you can get some of that, um, that to, to come through. And I, I will do some Photoshop stuff, you know, because I've, I might want to push it. Sometimes the images can be a little bit muddy. You know, they almost have like a, there's almost like a mid journey filter. That's like an Instagram filter. You know, you kind of recognize it. So um, I'll often take it into Photoshop and add some grain, add some flair, do maybe a little more compositing, putting these things together. But like I said, I don't do big, massive composites. So for me, it's, it's usually small tweaks or adding stuff or using it as a background element to put a product in the foreground, something like that. But um yeah, I think I think you can push 
you know, the AI to do what you want to do just by the nature of your, you know, the way you um, judge each image and decide which ones, like I said, to, to move forward with. That's awesome. I mean, I'm definitely not there yet because like, I, maybe it's more of my frustration coming out, but like when I'm going through, you know, my, my learning experience of trying to put images together, I work in layers, you know, my mind is thinking in layers from Photoshop. And I know like my foreground layer, my landscape layer, my portrait layer, you know, I have all these different layers that I'm working on. And that's my frustration with AI is I can't, I can't get all those layers to work exactly how I want it to. Uh, some of the only images that I ever have like publicly shown from my, a from the AI work, I found out the most successful way for me to actually adapt it into my work was just grab a component. So I wanted, I created a character and then I took that character and I created a landscape and then, uh, you know, then I created a pro, you know, and I put like four images together in Photoshop. And that was the only way I kind of felt like afterwards it was my, like my work or like at least got close to my work was because I was able to take these components and kind of put it back into my regular workflow and get back into my comfort zone of being able to like build an image. Um, I just couldn't get everything. I, I think I spent like an afternoon messing with prompts, trying to get it to react differently. And I finally was just like, this is ridiculous. And I had to just simplify it and get back to kind of how I thought I could, I could OCD it, you know, into, into place. That's and exactly I think how I'm using it. Like I, I view AI as an asset generator. I'm not viewing AI as a singular image maker. Like maybe it will be one day, but I want to be able to control, like I need to tell you the F-stop. I need to tell you where the light is going to be. I want an edge light on this side. I want the angle to be like a little bit higher than this. And if I can't tell you that specifically, then I'm going to have to talk to you like you're a two-year-old AI. I'm going to have to tell you, like, I want this on a blank background. And I want you to try to make it at this angle. And that's all. I'm not going to overcomplicate it. That's all you can handle right now. And then I grab that asset and then I do it again and I grab that asset. So I'm viewing AI very much as like a really shortcut, fast CGI thing where it's like, just give me the different assets and then I'm going to plop them together. So I don't have to shoot it and I don't have to render it in, in CG. So that's how I'm using it. Cause I, I too, Weston can't, get a singular image to look like me because it does look moody and muddy and like mid journey. So um, yeah, I definitely think that it's an asset generator right now. I don't think it always will be. And I'm excited for when it's no longer that, and I do have more control, but right now I don't have enough control. So it's just an asset generator. All right. Let me uh, jump in here for a second. Uh, I'm going to catch up on the questions and then I'm going to um, move our question over to, I'm going to use Caitlin's question about uh, copyright. Um, to transition some of this to Tom. But uh, let's catch up on some of the questions first. Um, Kevin asks, when one of you generate an image that you love after several trial versions, okay, that's the copyright question, so we'll call that later. Oh, uh, Kevin also asks, can we see any of the panel's AI images? Um, so because we're short on time, um, if we have if we have time later, uh, I'll show some. But uh, if you saw the uh, slideshow that was running uh, before the meeting began, uh, those uh, I think in Terry's case and in Caitlin's case, those were their AI images. Weston, am I right that those you, were, those were your composite photographs that, that that you shared? Yeah, yeah. The intro the intro was my composite work. Right, but okay. not, but not, none, nothing that was shown was AI. Okay, so if you saw that, then you. Um, then you've seen some of it. And if you didn't, um, there, there will be a link to that uh, at the end of the session. Um, all right, uh, Luke Copping. Do you see more relevant use with AI given the current state as best serving photographers as an output medium or a tool for, oh, for rapid idea prototyping to allow for easier creative communication with clients? Can I, can I tackle that one? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it's great for the ideation and the, the set design. You know, if you're not sure what your set wants to be, you can you can play with it in AI and then figure out where you want it to go. But like a, a good example for me of how I can use this technology just to move discussions along, I had a client reach out. They want to do a 15 second video for breakfast sandwiches. And I'm like, okay, give me a shot list. No, we don't have a shot list. We just know 15 seconds for X client. Well, that could be 30,000. That could be 300,000. I don't know. How am I going to bid this? So I went to ChatGPT and I said, write a script for a 15 second commercial about breakfast sandwiches. 
it spit out a script that was kind of generic, but it, it was, it kind of worked. I used that. I went to mid journey and I said, pencil sketch, you know, man eating breakfast sandwich, blah, 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 pencil sketch, you know, man waking up, whatever. And to go with the images. And then I could create a script and a storyboard that said, okay, if we do something like this, here's what we would need. And it also made me think about like, okay, all right, so an alarm clock, somebody getting out of bed, I'll have to think about that, how I'm gonna shoot that. Oh, I could shoot this scene this way. So it jump started my brain into how I was gonna tackle this video. And it also gave the client a clear roadmap. So they didn't say at the end, well, we thought you were gonna do like all of this stuff. And we go, no, we, we just bid a 15 second commercial. This way, everybody knows what we're bidding. And if it's, if we wanna make it less, if we wanna make it more, we know where we're starting. That's a super cool example. I love that you use chat GPT and mid journey together. That's, I wouldn't have thought to do that for scripting. That's cool. I had, I mean, I had an example with a client last week where it, it's definitely helping on uh, the communication level because I had a pencil sketch that came through from an agency request and they, you know, they wanted, they wanted something with a motorcycle and I, Kind of looked at what I had and I said, I don't really have anything um, to kind of show that I could pull from my own library. So I went into mid journey and kind of hurrying, created in you know 30 minutes time, a few examples of different motorcycles that I could be using or different uh, like kind of lifestyle examples, spit that back out to the client. And then it kind of created a real conversation that we were able to have going off of a pencil sketch that didn't have enough detail, uh, didn't show any lighting. So it really gave us a deeper conversation that I was able to bring into, you know, bring into my workflow to be able to start talking with my client. So instead of just being, I mean, I'm definitely more of a visual person. And I heard, I heard a, a quote that was given uh, that just says, you know, we're moving, we're moving out of probably the image, uh, the image age and more into the narrative age uh, with AI and being able to use the prompts. And I, you know, to me, that's a look, that's probably where I'm scared because everything I do is so visual. So um it's 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 fascinating but i think it's if you can learn how to use it and learn how to communicate with your clients it's going to help you leaps and bounds great all right so we've got a question from mark uh, i'm primarily an architectural photographer photographing buildings and products that already exist and the clients once represented so how will ai affect me in the next five to ten years i mean there's an unknown five to 10 years with the, how fast AI mo is moving. You know, I don't know how you would use it right now. Um, if you're already shooting stuff that's existing, you can kind of like take that to the next level and you can be putting those products into, into different examples into different narratives into uh, um, different scenarios that, you know, your client might not be, you know, might not be thinking, but it allows to show you kind of another level of the, of the services that you can provide for your, for your work. You're still not going to, you know, anytime I've tried to generate a product in AI, uh, it just is kind of garbled. It doesn't put like text on it, doesn't put anything correct. You know, it might give you a soda can, but it doesn't give you a Coke can. Um, you know, so you're still going to need to use some of that product stuff to be able to maybe put into an image. So you still, once again, going back to dropping it into Photoshop to really make it your own, um, blending images, it's not going to do all the work for you. Hopefully we don't ever get that lazy. Uh, you know, somebody asked me, have you ever been hired for AI? And I said, nope, never been hired for AI yet. And I hope I never, never will. Uh, just because I, I consider myself first and foremost a photographer and a digital artist, so. All right, uh, and uh, before we get to the next question, um, on that note of being hired for AI work, Caitlin, can you share your story? Yeah, so I've been hired for AI, but it's not anything crazy complex. It's kind of like the, cheap down and dirty version of having like a fully rendered CG surreal sort of environment. So in terms of like the previous question, uh, architecturally, I've got no input. I don't know whatsoever. Although I do know that Ikea uses CG rendered scenes most of the time for their stuff instead of actually shooting in, in sets. But um, yeah, so taking a product that you have shot that already exists, but using AI to create an environment that would either be way too expensive to do in camera or impossible in camera. Um, that's how I'm using AI. I'm creating environments that are surreal and fun and poppy and funky. Um, that would be very expensive if it was rendered in CG because it would take a lot of time, but it's AI. It takes me two hours to do it. So that falls in really well with social media because a lot of clients want a ton of content and they want it on a tighter budget 
because they need so much of it. Um, so me being able to use AI to pump out a fun little animation with a surreal atmosphere or environment and a real photo of their product in it takes me two hours to create one of those. So um, yeah, I, I was reached out to the first um, AI animation little series that I did was I imagined that the brand Polly Pocket had created like a, a beauty brand. So I used Mid Journey to create pastel themed um, beauty products. And then I used it to create pastel themed different um, sets and environments. And then in Photoshop, I composited them together. And then in After Effects, I animated them um, and I posted it. And it was only like a day or two later that I had a creative director reach out to me. And she works with a, a small agency that's like exclusively working on social media for various brands. Um, and she said that she didn't know a whole lot about AI, but she was just wanting to figure out what was going on with it. So she went to Instagram and she typed in AI and she said mine was one of the first that popped up on her feed. Um, so I have no idea how much the hashtags influence that or not, because I, I am pretty um, rigid with my my hashtag usage. So I'm doing all sorts of like AI, AI art, AI photography, commercial photography, art director, creative director. So I have no idea how much that directed me to her or not. But um, so she reached out to me and we have this ongoing relationship now where anytime she has one of her brands needing, you know, a quick little animated reel for Instagram because reel and animation is king right now over on Instagram, then I just pop in. I use some of the photos that um, her she already has existing in her asset library so she doesn't have to have it shot again. Um, so essentially, I'm just kind of becoming like a digital artist or a digital retoucher instead of photographer in that case. But I'm OK with it. It's fun. AI is short and it just gives me more practice every single day with AI. But I get paid to do it. So. All right, uh, Tom, we're going to jump to you and uh, a question for you. Do you want to start with your summary of the lay of the land or do you want to jump into answering questions uh, 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 from the Q&A? Yeah, I'll start with a summary, and then I will uh, uh, probably answer some of the questions that are in the Q and A just naturally, and then we'll we'll pick up some other ones. Um, so, so first of all, uh, I'm only going to talk for a, a few minutes on something that has such incredibly deep legal implications on all sides. I want to show you all a few things, and I'm going to start, as Ben said, with kind of a little bit of the lay of the land, right? And what we're seeing is that copyright law, you might have heard me say this a year ago about something else, but copyright law is in no way ready to deal with AI at any level, no matter whether it's input or output. And there is a huge group of things that we have no idea about. But roughly on the legal side and on the copyright side, we can think of it in, in, in a couple of phases, right? There's the uh, the images that comprise the training materials and the data sets that have trained the AI how to generate the images that you saw Ben generate and, and what we've been talking about today. These computers have to get images from somewhere to learn what it means when you say erase a statue and put in a puppy, right? That Those training sets are probably the, the biggest point of contention for artists and photographers right now. The, the subsequent copyright issues are equally important, but people just haven't gotten to them yet. And when I talk about training sets, there's a, a number of lawsuits that are going on right now. The biggest one is this lawsuit, Getty Images versus Stable Diffusion. And they brought this lawsuit first in the UK, and then uh, back in early February in the US. And I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. Well, let me say it this way. What, what happened is Getty sued Stable Diffusion and said, hey, you stole all of our images, all of the images that were online. And they said, do you know how we can prove it to you? We can prove it because your AI generated images have a garbled Getty images watermark on them. On the left is an original image that was in the Getty Images uh, database. And on the right is a stable diffusion produced AI image. And this is as close to a smoking gun as you can find in copyright law, right? You know, this isn't, this isn't well, we think it might have come from this. This is our watermark is there on these images. And I'll show you one more example. 
this uh, <laughs> AI is improving every day. This was from a few months ago, but I mean, those are some, some crazy faces there. The point is, th in the AI generated works, they were including the watermark just naturally. The so Getty Images sued for one point eight trillion dollars which was every image they could identify times $150,000, which is, you know, the willful infringement um, upper limit. Obviously, this isn't going to be a trillion dollar lawsuit, but it is the first time that the courts are going to really take a look at can images that go into a training set, is that copyright infringement to put images into a training set without getting them licensed? That brings up point number two for photographers. And um, and I forget if I mentioned this, but uh, I really am impressed with Ohio Valley for coming out with this panel right now. You're going to see a lot of more information on this. Um, and so if we don't get to answer all the questions, um, I'm probably going to invite some of these uh, fine panelists uh, to, to do some programs with us as well. Uh, so keep an eye on the upcoming events because this feels like something we're going to be doing some town halls on pretty soon. Um, the question is this, how do you know if your copyrighted work is in an image training set? Well, the, the point is you don't necessarily know for sure, but there's a great website. And if you haven't used it, it's worth checking out. And it is haveibeentrained.com. And you can either upload an image or put in your name or put in the type of work that you do and see if your photographs pop up. If your photographs pop up, then you are in the uh, one of the training databases for these AI groups. So without picking on anyone's in particular name, I just typed in American Society Media Photographers. And it turns out that a lot of our logos and a lot of our chapters are in these training databases, right? Um, if you are an active photographer who's putting your work out online, um, you will likely find your, your work here. Right. You know, it's uh, um, <laughs> you are probably in these databases. Let me say it that way. So then the question is, is that copyright infringement? And that's one of the things that the courts are attempting to answer. Right. But then we have the other half of the equation, and that is who owns the copyright to works that are created that come out of this? And secondarily, um, what? what does that even, what does the U.S. Copyright Office think about some of this? And so if you were paying attention last fall, you saw that uh, an illustrator, a comic book artist, got a, a copyright registration granted for a completely AI-generated AI work. The Copyright Office, uh, after she got some news coverage, went back and said, hey, we're going to take a second look at this. And they rescinded the parts of the registration that were AI generated. They left in the, uh, the composition, selection, and arrangement of the illustrations used in the comic book. They said that's copyrightable, but the actual, the actual images are not. Because the, the Copyright Office has now said, and they've said this in court here in the last few weeks, that the, to get a U.S. copyright, there has to be a significant level of human involvement, right? And so a substantial level of human involvement. And so they have unequivocally said that AI, complete AI generated images without any human involvement are not eligible for copyright protection. And they're going to deny those. But here's the thing. You've heard some of these panelists talk about, you know, uh, uh, that using AI as an image asset generator. So then you take it and you go to the next level and you add your own things to it. At that point, you are in the realm of things that are likely to be copyrightable, but it's still a little up in the air. If you were to ask me, how should I register that work? I would say you have to disclose on your copyright registration what you did versus what was AI generated. Because if you get down the road and you're trying to rely on that copyright registration, there's a good chance that it could be thrown out if you haven't disclosed the fact that the underlying image assets may have been AI generated. And 
there are a lot of questions that I see in chat uh, or in the Q and A that I want to answer. Um, I will I will wrap up my overview uh, with this, and I'll say, um, I was in Washington D.C. on December tenth, meeting with government officials, and I met with the um, the the Register of Copyright, Shira Perlmutter, and we talked about AI in in this meeting, right? And the what we talked about on December tenth doesn't matter anymore. Things are moving really fast and really fast on the legal side too. And so you're going to need to keep up to date on this kind of stuff. I will I will say one other word of caution. And that is, I think I am going to be recommending to all ASMP members that somewhere on your website, you have something that says, this work is available for licensing for AI training data sets, even if you never intend to do that. And the reason is that you have to be able to show harm, that if someone takes your images, you have to be able to show that you've, you've, you have economic harm from that if you ever want to pursue that for copyright infringement, right? A good way to show that is to say, hey, I'm in this market. This is what I do for a living. I, I license my work for all these uses, including AI data training sets. If you have that on there, I think that's going to be a piece that's going to be worthwhile. Um, I've been coming out with a few things. Uh, we're going to have a white paper on this that we're going to um, that we're going to distribute to members about things photographers should be thinking about and doing in relation to AI. Stay tuned for that. Um, but yeah, I will stop talking there. Um, that's as little as you all have ever heard me talk at a panel. And I'm ready, Ben, to answer any questions on on my side. But um, I'm more than happy to also hear from other panelists as well. I appreciate that. I, I heard you speak a little bit about that at a summit meeting last week uh, when you were talking about AI. And one thing that I, you know, one thing that kind of I made a note about when you were mentioning that was it kind of always comes back to the photographer, too. Like, we have to be able to protect ourselves. There's so many there's so many photographers that I will talk to. And they'll say, well, my 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 work's caught, you know, is copyrighted. Uh, and then I always say, oh, did you license it? You know, did you register it with the US copyright? And they say, oh no, it's just because I created it. And I don't think that's good enough. You know, for you to be, you know, for you to actually have some type of an argument, it's like what you're saying, Thomas. You need to put a little bit of effort, you need to post something to say that you have some type of harm because you put more effort than just, you know, clicking the button, taking the picture. You did something. And um, I know I've got a, I've got a hard stop, so I'm going to be jumping off here in a couple of minutes. But um, like I saw something that I, you know, I gave a lot of respect for. And that was uh, there was a, an e-blast uh, notice that came up from the the photo rep Heather Elder, if uh, if everyone is familiar with him or her. And so she was posting work about Andy Anderson's work, and at the bottom of her her post, she made the comment, and I'll just read it here. It says. Note, all images were generated by Andy via Midjourney. It says, thank you to all artists whose work is part of these images. And so I thought it was a very respectful, professional way of being able to say, you know, Andy might have been the one, you know, to kind of direct and be the director of those images, but there were other artists involved in it, which I thought was very respectful. So um, I think it, AI is not, you know, there's going to be a lot coming down, like you're saying, Thomas, but there's going to be a lot that we're still responsible to do as an artist for us to be able to claim our own work. Absolutely, absolutely. And you bring up an interesting point that I will just, I will share my screen real quickly again, because I, I, it, one thing I want you all to get in the habit of is reading terms of use and they're annoying. And frankly, I don't think I've ever recommended that, that to photographers in the past, but I'm gonna start recommending it when you're dealing with AI stuff. This is open AI's terms of use, right? And if you read through this, they do not, you do not grant copyright to the AI companies when you use their, their uh, services by and large for the big ones, certainly. Always keep an eye on that, though. You'll probably hear about that if you do. But look at number two, usage requirements. You are not allowed to represent that the output from the services was human generated when it was not. That's part of the terms of service. So it's not just a good thing to do to say that this is AI generated stuff. You have to do it. And they all have things that are similar to that. And I think you're going to see a lot of lawsuits in the near future with clients 
who hired a photographer. The photographer used some sort of AI elements in it. They didn't necessarily tell the client in the same way that you might buy a stock image and use it as a sky or a background in the past. But the client is going to say, hey, you delivered something to me that you didn't even follow the terms of use. This isn't what I paid for. I'm, I'm not paying you. I'm suing you. I want my money back. You know, you can't do this. I was involved in a lawsuit about that uh, uh, last year. And so I think that disclosure here, uh, until we start understanding the rules of the road a little bit better, is incredibly important. Wow. I'm going to jump off, so I'm sorry to cut. I'm just going to say thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. I really look forward to seeing how this uh, the work generates as well as this conversation uh, progresses. So good night, everybody. Thanks. Thank Weston. you, Weston. All right. Uh, let's see if we can. Uh, oh, so just checking with the panelists, uh, Tom, Caitlin, Terry, are you, we're just about hitting eight. Um, are you guys OK to hang in there? There's seems yep. like there's still a lot of questions uh, to ask. Yep. All right. Um, Tanya has a question um, for Tom about photographers contributing to magazines in written form or images using AI. So, you know, I think that different types of 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 photographers are going to have different ethical obligations, even beyond the legal ones. For example, uh, I see in the participants list many uh, many of our our new ASMP brethren here from Nampa. The nature photographers have a very interesting situation going on. Disclosure and ethical practices in nature photography is incredibly important. It's even more important with AI. If you are in a part of photography that is um, that where you're contributing to a work to a, a company or a work like a magazine, and you don't disclose the things you need to disclose, that's grounds to terminate your contract. That's grounds for all the things that that we were talking about. I think you need to be very above board. And one of the things that really impressed me about this panel and these panelists is a lot of photographers right now are taking a, the sky is falling, AI is the devil, we hate it, we never, how can you stop it? And they're, they're calling me and they're saying, are you, are, you, are you going to try to get a law going to stop AI? And, and no, you need to do what, what these photographers are doing. And, and what, what Terry and Caitlin and Weston are doing is they're embracing AI as part of their business model. And I think that that is, it, you cannot hide from this. This is going to come for everyone in photography. And you have to figure out how to utilize these tools in the best way possible. Um, so uh, to the extent that that answered your question, Tanya, I'm not sure it exactly did. But if you if you expand a little more, I'll be happy to talk a little more about it. But, um, oh, by the way, I saw one question, which I thought was worth answering. And it ties into this real quickly. There's a very interesting open question. You saw at the beginning when Ben was doing his demo, a very long prompt, right? The one that had all the details in it. Is that prompt copyrightable in and of itself as a written thing? That's an interesting question because then you could, you could argue that, that that prompts are creative works entitled to copyright protection and kind of have a back door into what can be protected. Now, I have talked with a few people about that, but not a ton. That's not been advanced in, in, in a legal situation. By and large, prompts are not things that are, that are intellectual property protected, but it's worth keeping an eye on. If you, write it, if you write four paragraphs of description, I might argue that that is enough creative input to, to have that writing piece be um, be copyright protectable. Uh, all right. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Tanya, it, you wrote, can I ask this on camera? And I'm not sure if that was before Tom answered all your questions. So I'm going to oh, click sorry. allow to talk. All right, Tanya, can you unmute? Hi. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Hey. Okay, great. Thank you, Thomas. Yes. I, so, and I added this in the questions section too, is I am really asking that from a, a magazine editor's perspective because I am launching a photography education magazine this month. Um, Terry's a little bit familiar with it since I was at one of the ASMP meetings and we talked about it. Um, but yeah, I've had a couple people ask me uh, 
if they can send in AI generated, like I asked one photographer if they would like to write a, an article about podcasts because they, I know they're, they're heavily involved in that. Well, she sent me in two minutes, a complete article on how to start a podcast. <laughs> and I was like, what am I, I mean, what, ha, what are yeah. the legal ramifications there? How can I can, you know, credit her as the author when all she did was type in, Hey, do this. And, and at this point, I'm just refusing those kind of contributions because I'm afraid like who's going to get sued me or the person doing mm-hmm. it. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I think that, um, and I, I, now I, I understand your question better. I've talked with a few yeah. companies in the last, in the last week, actually. And my recommendation is that, um, organizations and companies, um, and, and, and publications have a written down and public code of ethics and conduct with respect to AI generated works. You have to, mm-hmm. it, it, this goes to, you know, if in the future there's the a court case that comes out that would make you liable for a number of things, you have to have already been asking your contributors what's AI generated and what's not. And right. because you need to be able to scrub that that data if if that is the case, right? Now, that may never mm-hmm. be the case. But I think as a publication, you have a responsibility internally to let your contributors know what your stances are. In the same way mm-hmm. that publications now, there's still publications that only accept black and white work or, or film-based work or landscape work or whatever the case is, you get to choose um, uh, what is submitted to you. But I would also argue that forward-thinking publications are going to be embracing AI. The question is, where between those two extremes do do you, right. do you fall? And I don't know yeah. that there's a legal answer to that. That's more of a business question. Uh, but mm-hmm. I think it's a really good one. And and stay in touch because I think we might do something like that for magazine editors in the future. So. Great. And Thank Tanya, you very much. Tanya, let me just add really quickly. Uh, yeah. Um, there are, uh, you've probably seen this, uh, there are some academic researchers who use um, AI like ChatGBT as part of, you know, helping them do their research. Mm-hmm. And they are publishing, they are publishing scientific papers and um, crediting an AI as a co-author. Uh, okay. Um, Sequoia Capital did a, I don't know if they called it a white paper or something, but they they did an article on AI um, estimating what its impact on uh, the economy was going to be. And it was written by two Sequoia employees, and it also credited ChatGBT. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so there, I think there's a precedent um, emerging with that. I, I think until we find out what what's going to ha- I mean, I feel like we're going to have something come up and say, like, because what Thomas said, it's got to come from somewhere. And I keep thinking of the of the saying, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, everything is kind of like it's out there. Where is it pulling these articles from? You know, what if somebody comes up and finally finds, oh, this was my article that it that it brought all this from. And then and then I'm in trouble because we use that article in the in the magazine. So, yeah, I, I think I'm going to hold off just for a bit just to see maybe let other publications try it out first, maybe, and just see what happens there. Thank you, guys. In that same vein, that's it's interesting that like because I reached out to quite a few ad agencies, you know, two weeks after I started using AI and I was like, hey, I'm on the forefront. Here's AI if you want to try it the overwhelming majority of them were like, we're not touching that. <laughs> like we're, we're not touching that <laughs> until something hits the fan. Cause it, something bad is going to happen eventually. Uh, on the flip side, there is a project that I'm currently a part of where the brand was like, we don't care. Like we're, we want to be the first, like maybe there's going to be a big problem, but we're going to be the first. So we're going to be getting a lot of press good or bad upfront about this. Um, so with that project that I'm currently doing, I'm, I'm teaming up with another photographer. Um, and he was like, we, we need to get an attorney to write up something to hand to the client for the client client to sign that says we, as the creators are not liable in case something happens later on. So 
you guys are paying us to be the technicians here and we will create this for you. But in case you guys, you know, get sued in the future for something that has to do with copyright, we're not the ones that are liable because we're just the technicians. So that's kind of how we're going about it. But yeah, it's interesting how some people are like, no, we're not touching that at all. We got to wait until something bad happens and other people are volunteering. Like I will be the tribute, you know, <laughs> like I, I will be the bad something that happens because I want to be the first. So yeah, interesting times. I've had um, similar experience, but not but a different outcome, I guess, because I've done two projects that were paid for mid, you know, using mid journey and AI. One was to create a background for another product and they just stripped that product in front of it, created the background specifically to work with it. So it would, you know, look natural when they stripped it in. Um, and then the other one was for a Fortune 500 company. And we were doing a combination of product photography and more graphic AI generated image. It, it wasn't anything that looked actually real. It was meant to be more, um, you know, just artistic, I guess, to merge with that product photography. Now it was early stages of the product. So it was something that they were doing for kind of conceptual, you know, as it, as it moves the, the design forward. So I don't know if the AI will stay a part of it or if it was just kind of for the first round, but you know, it was, it was utilized in those ways um, to be a part of that. So I'm finding that I do have uses for it and that I can work it into things. And certainly for content creators, I think it's a huge, huge opportunity. If you've got a, you know, like I stripped in a, a, a cake box to a, to a kitchen set. And I thought, you know, if you were just doing this for Facebook, like you couldn't build a kitchen set and shoot the cake box in it for three days on Facebook. But if I can create the whole kitchen in AI and just shoot a cake box on gray, I can do that for three days on Facebook. So for content creation, I think this has got some huge possibilities and probably not open to as many of the copyright issues because, you know, you're just putting it up quickly on a social media channel, you know, probably not as likely to get called out as if it's on a package on store shelves nationwide. All right, so we've got, um, uh, let me just do a quick um, uh, gut check here. Um, there were a couple examples that I wanted to show uh, that were done by agencies, but I kind of feel like since we have such little time, maybe I'll just send those out as links that people can see after the meeting. That way, we, that way any questions from the panelists, um, you know, we can maximize their time. So there are some agency uh, videos that I thought were really cool showing the kind of work they've done. But uh, I'm going to share them, not in the meeting, but in an email uh, that'll go out um, sometime after the meeting. Great. Uh, all right. So let's see. We have some more questions. Um, from Matt, uh, has anyone looked closely at terms with Adobe stock? Yeah. Tom, do we know anything about that? Yeah, so the the question here is, do we think Adobe Stock is using their stock library to train, you know, Adobe based AI products? Um, um, so the panel I was on last Friday was with uh, uh, Santiago Leon, uh, who's the head of Adobe's content uh, authenticity initiative, right? And um, one, um, I would I would argue that that they likely are not. Um, I think Adobe's actually been really good with transparency. Some of the others have not. Um, I don't know if y'all were following. Uh, I think it was DeviantArt uh, last year who essentially made their whole library uh, open and sent it in to be uh, that said AI. Um, AI could use its library for training purposes. They didn't inform the users. And then they informed the users and they said, well, if you don't like that, you can you can opt out by taking your work off, right? That's not a good way to do it. Um, other groups are in the middle. Uh, Shutterstock has taken a very AI forward approach. And, um, uh, you know, you do need to look at the, the terms of service here for these different groups and keep an eye on what's been changing there, there's a lot of money in that, right? And so the question is, um, which groups are, 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 are doing that? I will tell you right now, the climate is such that I doubt many of the big ones are because there would be a lot of backlash. Um, and the backlash on this from artists and creators started last fall in a big way and accelerated in January and February insanely. Remember y'all, this isn't, really something that is is negatively affecting photographers yet 
the groups it's negatively affecting most are authors almost more than anyone else imagine i mean you can output a book with chat gpt4 which was just launched today you know the new version um and illustrators especially are getting are are, are getting killed now i will tell you by the end of the year I mean, I'm I, I'm confident that photography will be at the same level of quality as as the other things I've mentioned. So we are going to have to worry about it. But my point is that right now, it would be a pretty foolish mistake if if Adobe were doing that and that became public. That would be a huge black eye. Um, I think transparency is the name of the game with these companies, and I think they understand that right now. All but right. no, I uh, haven't read their actual terms of service in the last six months, and so maybe it isn't there. So. We'll <laughs> All right, Tom, another question for you. Uh, this one from Rocky. Uh, he says, let's say you create an ad with an AI for a pharmaceutical company um, and the AI, gen the AI generates an image of a man that is the spinning image of a professional sports figure who was in the media but has been retired for many years. He spots it and is not happy with what he regards as an unauthorized use of his image. Of course, there is no model to release. Can he sue the parties involved for invasion of privacy? Really tricky question. When 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 I heard the first part of the question, I was thinking it was copyright based, and I had an answer. But the second part, where it turns into right of publicity based, is is a whole different can of worms, right? In copyright law, we worry about access and substantial similarity. Those are the two things we have to have to have a copyright infringement. And so you could make an argument that if an AI spit out something and you submitted it to a client. You personally didn't have access to this and, you know, even there might be substantial similarity, but you were not involved in the training set and the data. And so you as a photographer might be protected in that way. But right of publicity is different. Right of publicity is entirely about would a person off the street think that this product or service is being endorsed by this celebrity? And if you have some uh, a picture, an AI generated picture where the person is recognizable almost to to anyone off the street and then they're used in a in in that kind of way i can almost guarantee that company is going to get sued or at least get a strongly worded letter and then the question is is that defensible and it may be i don't think i've run across a case about that yet and i hadn't honestly rocky i hadn't even thought about that which um i'm going to be thinking more about it because that's actually a really interesting piece to this, uh, the right of publicity issues if someone looks like like someone recognizable. Because I would argue, as a lawyer, my gut reaction is, if that person could be seen by a general person to be endorsing that product or service, they would have a right of publicity claim. And then you as the photographer, you're screwed because you you don't know every person in the world, right? You you don't know if someone in this looks like some sports star from the 70s that you've never even heard of from a different country. And so I do think you're going to have to put some language in your contracts about some of this. Um, and when I say you're going to have to put some language in your contracts, that means I'm going to have to write some language so that we can get it in people's contracts. And those that's an important consideration. So. See, I think this is a good use case for AI because you say, I need a picture of somebody's face on a package, but I don't want it to be recognizable. I want it to be just normal. And you could you could generate that face and you don't have any modeling fees. You don't have any usage fees, especially if your product were you know a little bit controversial and it was hard to get people to sign on. You can create that with AI and create a face you know, that could go with the product. I think it's a great opportunity to use AI. I think it's a but great I think it's a great opportunity unless unless you know it is that it is it looks exactly like like someone who who is litigious right you know right. that's why remember when we all shoot portraits there's sensitive use clauses you know if you you had to think in advance is this product or service such that I need a separate release because it's you know whatever it is it's a sensitive use and and so I think AI is a perfect a perfect solution for what you're talking about, Terry, with the downside that if it doesn't work, it might actually be a really bad situation, but we don't know, right? And I'm right. going to be keeping an eye on court cases about that. That's really interesting. Uh, so Brian has a question uh, to you, Terry. I, I think Caitlin answered um, for herself. 
Um, do you have terms and conditions that you're using to protect your company from liability uh, when using AI? No. Um, I hesitate to say that with Tom here. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, I don't. Because to me, I, I kind of view this uh, it maybe flippant, but I kind of view it like it's like Photoshop. Like I don't disclose when I Photoshop something and I Photoshop everything. I recognize that there's still copyright issues to be resolved on the input and on the output. So from that side, I definitely see the need to do something. But right now, I don't feel the need to disclose it because I think it's just another tool in my tool belt. That's my belief. And I'm kind of just approaching it that way. Um, maybe short-sighted, maybe naive. And I recognize that you know a lot of things can change in the next year. But um, for me right now, I'm really just playing with it as a tool. I'm using it as a way I can learn and see where this goes. I just feel like we're, we're you know, rather than try to protect what we have and say, it's our copyright, you can't use our images. Let's just get on board and go with this technology because it's gonna be so you know, revolutionary to our industry and the things we can do and what we can accomplish. I would rather be on you know, that side of it. If I'm an artist 150 years ago, I wanna pick up a camera and start going with it. Yeah, I'm not concerned about trying to protect my stuff that I'm creating right now. I'm just concerned about covering my butt in case someone comes along and is like, hey, what you created used what I created. So I don't want the dominoes to fall and then me to be like, Whoop, whoops, I've kind of messed up with that client. But yeah, I, I agree with you in, in the same way that I'm I'm being messy and fast and chaotic and just letting it roll because nothing is perfect right now with AI. It's not going to be for a little while and I just want to play with it and learn. And if somebody wants to pay me to pump out some stuff while I'm playing and learning, then cool, we're good. But yeah, I don't, I'm not really concerned about trying to protect or copyright the things that, because I'm not selling copyright. Whenever I'm getting paid to do these things, I intentionally am not doing any sort of copyright or selling usage fees or licensing. I'm not doing any of that just in case something does come across later where it's like, oh, wait you can't copyright anything with AI in it. And then the clients come back and they're like, well, we want, we want a refund because what did we buy then if, if we're not buying a usage right for that? So mm -hmm. I'm currently just charging like my hourly as if I'm just being a retoucher for that. So I'm not doing license fees yet with AI. All right. Uh, so Br Brian has a question. Does This is a technical question. Does AI currently have the ability to create the same face over and over again? Not really. No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Brian, I'll, I'll, oh, go ahead. Um, the closest that I've gotten, if I, this is not a face, but if I wanted to have a particular style of a cloud, and by that, I mean, like, I want the cloud to be made out of marshmallows. So something that is clearly not a cloud, um, but I need multiple of them in the scene. Uh, the best way that I've been able to get it to replicate that has either been to do variations, which whenever you get a, a generated image, then you have the ability to use this, but make variations of this. Um, so that's how I've been trying to get consistency with a particular item if I need it to be replicated or also then taking that image off, pumping it back into AI and giving it a new prompt to where it's, it's being based off of that first image. Um, but in terms of faces, in a weird way, I've seen like trends and faces at mid journey because there is a style that they use over and over again so it's like i feel like i've seen that face in a lot of other things um but not exactly so it can't replicate it for like a series of it being clearly the same person over and over again and uh, let me uh, add my two cents in terms of the same face question um uh if you submit uh training data around a specific face then you can control that, you know, you can control that face in the output. Um, so one of the benefits of, um, and, and you guys have to tell me, because I'm not sure if you can do this with MidJourney. Um, if you're using something like Stable Diffusion, which again is open source, and so it's packaged in lots of different ways, um, you know, you can tell it which model uh, uh, to use. So you can create a, uh, a training set that's made of, images that you need of, of, of your cast or the family or, or whoever you're photographing. And if you have enough of those images, then when you're choosing an output, you say, you know, use, use this training set of, of Bob's face, and then it's going to generate Bob's face and variations of Bob's face. But that is now you're getting, uh, you're moving from the out of the box, you know, um, when you just sign up and you start typing, 
now you're having to create your own training data, uh, which which uh, people are doing. Again, that's one of the advantages of something like stable diffusion. Um, there are a whole bunch of third parties creating um, models that will affect the output. Um, you uh, you guys will be uh, will chuckle to know that there's there are models um, designed to make stable diffusion look like mid journey. Uh, you know, made by mid journey fan, or made by uh, stable diffusion fans who like the mid journey mid journey look, but like the stable journey uh, stable diffusion architecture. Uh, in the in the comments uh, to us, uh, Luke wrote a comment which I think is worth touching on, and and it's a really good point, which is because there's a mass of celebrity images out there that are in these data training sets, it's probably more likely that faces of that are close to celebrity faces would be emergent. Um, and I, I actually think it's a really interesting and a good point. And, and again, this is, um, you all are, are watching me process something in real time that I hadn't really, I haven't really thought about before. So I think that's a really good point. Yeah. And, and uh, Luke, that gets to, um, you know, there are articles now that say that um, tra the, tr the faces from the training data can emerge directly into the output. It, it wasn't, it's not supposed to happen, um, but they have, uh, you know, researchers have shown documented cases where um, you can find a face that came directly from the training data. It's not like a version of the face, it's the face. And, and my, my point on this is not that, my point is that if your client gets a delivery from you of an image and then they get sued by a celebrity, you're getting pulled in, right? They're not going to just say, oh, well, cool. We're, we'll just deal with it, right? And, and so, you know, I think that's where you probably are going to want to put some things in your contracts that talk about, you know, you know, the tools I use include photoshop and different lights and ai based tools and other things like, like we were talking about we all already use ai based tools with content war fill and some of these other ai that are generating things right but this is going to become more and more of an issue and remember the photographers are generally the ones the only ones in a lawsuit that don't have lawyers your client does the people who's suing them do you know ed the celebrity does everyone's angry and the only one who doesn't have a lawyer is you all, which is why what's your in your contracts is so important. Okay. All right. So um, I think we probably should try to start wrapping things up. Uh, there's uh, there's one more question from Mark, and then uh, if any doesn't if anyone doesn't have anything else, uh, we'll just do a, a couple of wrap up comments. Uh, so Mark asked, um, is there no way a photographer can get paid for letting their photos be trained into AI? like a stock fee or royalties? Yes, there is a way. There is a way. And um, I, I <laughs> if I can get it done this week, I'll get it done. But uh, in the ASMB document library, you're going to see a document we've been working on, which is new licensing language uh, for AI data training sets. Um, you, you know, you can, you can license work specifically for that purpose. Um, there, we're talking about the big AI players, but you can imagine there's a lot of smaller ones too. And there are AI data training sets that are specifically curated to either not have copyrighted work in it so that you know that the output is always safe. And there's AI data training sets that people are creating that are specifically only licensed work. So I do think there's a way to do that in a market to do that. And you should, that will be moving forward. I think part of standard licensing language is at least some reference to AI, whether you're cool with it or you're not, it probably will end up in your licenses. Okay. Uh, Robert asked a question way back. I don't, I don't know. Hopefully he's still on the call. Uh, he said, I shoot interior design and sometimes I need to direct models in a large space. Sometimes I render them in but I'm curious to see how AI would handle this. Have any of you seen this specific application with AI? You mean using AI to create the models and the people that are in the space? That's that's how I read it, yes. Yeah. 
I personally am trying to avoid using AI for people altogether because it's just not there yet with the quality. I mean, it will be eventually, but it's just not there yet. So, I mean, if you just need them small and if you want to add like a motion blur, like, you know, that style where people are walking in a space and it's not really about the people, it's about the space. I could see AI being really useful for that. Um, you can't necessarily control the angle very well, which is when it starts getting tricky. If you, if you want them in a specific location in the environment, that's going to be a lot harder to control. Um, but I mean, why not give it a shot if it's not a super recognizable person? Um, yeah, but quality is just not there yet for me in terms of photorealism with people. And uh, let me throw a couple things in. Um, uh, I think this is tech, what I'm about to describe is technically possible, but maybe not practical. Um, there, uh, if you've seen, uh, the, a lot of the full body shots on stable diffusion and Dolly 2, they're pretty terrible, right? The face, the faces don't look good. I think one of the examples that um, uh, Tom showed in, in the articles that when he did his screen share, the faces weren't good. And those were, be those were because those were full body shots. And the reasons those faces don't look good in those is because the original source material that the training set is done on is very small. Uh, I mean, the, the, the pixel resolution is very small. So imagine the face right, as a percentage of the size of a full body shot. So that's why the faces turn out pretty poorly um, on those platforms um, when you try to do them. Uh, the general recommendation when you wanna do a full body shot is to actually render, do a headshot first, and then do a out paint to build in the rest of the body. Uh, because then you get like the most crucial detail, the face going, and then you can build out the rest of the body through out painting. Um, and then as far as uh, like poses and things, one of the cool things is, you know, you, uh, when, when I talk about image to image, you can actually sketch the exact pose that you want your, uh, you know, your model to have, and then submit that to your AI as an image to image render. And the AI will pay attention. So if like, if you drew the pose that needed to be like this, but you couldn't, you know, describe that in words, you could draw that, you know, just with stick figures even. And if the AI is, is good enough, it will render a pose uh, following your stick figure. Can I, uh, can I jump in? Yeah, go Terry, yes. I'm, I'm gonna answer Lindsay's question here at the end. It said, um, I feel like AI is taking away from the creative freedom of the photographers. How do you both feel about this? Um, I'll just jump in and say, I think that it's giving me freedom. I think it's allowing me to do all kinds of things. You know, I, one of the things I've talked about um, some other times is that for me, I, when I started my career, I shot everything. I shot models, I shot people. And I really enjoyed the models and, and the stuff we did. I shot product, I shot diapers, I did everything. And, you know, it took a little while for food to become the main thing. But once it did, nobody thought I could shoot anything else. It's great. I got wonderful food assignments, but I miss shooting some of the people stuff. But really for me at this point in my career, am I going to start paying models to, you know, start doing a book and hair and makeup and wardrobe, unless it's going to be, you know, my new avenue of, of income, I'm not going to spend that money. But with mid journey and with AI, I can dabble in that. I can play with people. I can do some of this stuff. I can explore it. I can see what it's like. I can try stuff. And for me, it's just opened me up and brought me around to so many other things I was interested in and wanted to do. But professionally, I've focused on food for the last 30 years because that's been, you know, the majority of my work. But now I feel like I can explore and do all these other things again. And so creatively, I think it is opening me up to all kinds of possibilities. So I don't, I don't feel inhibited by it at all. Yeah, for me, the, um, the project that I'm currently working on with the other photographer and this brand that's very interested in using AI, it's still up in the air, whether it's going to go through with AI or not, just everything's up in the air. Um, but I will say it's forcing them to give me creative freedom, which is new because clients have such specific it must be this, it must be this angle, it must be lit this way. The art director is over your shoulder telling you exactly how they want it. With the AI, they can do that with us photographing the product, but when it comes to the AI, they are forced to step back and give me a mood board and be like, try to make AI do something that feels like this. So mm -hmm. I get to sit there and I get to have more freedom. So I'm like, mm, I don't really like that one. Let's move on to something else or let's take this piece and that piece and put it together. So in my mind, from my experience so far, if it does continue to go in this direction, it's forcing the creativity to be given back to us that has been stolen from us. I say stolen, that's very melodramatic, but that's how it feels sometimes. So, yeah. 
Agree. Okay. Um, all right. So I, I am going to wrap it up unless uh, Tom, uh, Caitlin, Terry, are any last comments you want to make before I say my piece? Uh, AI is not the enemy. So try to get on board and be happy and find your way to make it a tool for yourself because you add value on top of it. You just have to find it. Don't tell yourself you don't. Nice. Thank you, Caitlin. Terry, any, uh, any final yeah. thoughts? Well, oh, sorry. I'll, go ahead, Tom. Yep. Go yeah. Tom. All, all I'll say is uh, is stay tuned uh, to uh, to ASMP. Check out uh, the upcoming events. We're going to be announcing a lot of stuff, including whenever we put documents in the document library, or we write new licensing language, or there are big news stories that are going to drop um, about this. Uh, we'll try to include them in our in our weekly newsletters. Uh, but um, uh, we'll we'll stay on top of it for y'all on the legal side and the business. Yeah, Great. and I would. Thank you, Tom. I would just say that, you know, those of you that are here and joining these webinars, stuff like this, I think it's important that you follow along with this technology, whether it's something you want to embrace or not. I think that just understanding and having knowledge of it gives you more power with your clients and your work because you can say, no, I don't do AI and here's why. Did you realize that this could happen or that could happen? So I think that, you know, whether you're for it or against it doesn't matter to me. It's just that you're educating yourself so that you're not speaking out of ignorance, but you're speaking out of, yes, I've looked at it and I want to do it because of this or I don't want to do it because of that. So, you know, just uh, good for you to, to, you know, keep involving yourself and looking at what's happening. And I think following up on these other opportunities and just continue to learn because this is going to affect all of us probably one way or the other, but it's going to affect all of us. Great. Okay. So I'm just going to, um, say a few comments and then we will wrap up. Uh, and, and before I do, I just wanna to say to everyone, thank you so much for attending. Uh, okay, so here's my last share. I'm gonna to try to do a screen share one more time. Those stories to life wasn't limited by our resources, but only by our imagination. Welcome to Wonder Studio, where making movies with CGI is as simple as uses AI to track the actor's performance across cuts and automatically animates, lights, and composes the CG character directly into the scene. Everything from body motion, this needs is a camera.
magazine, the Cosmo. But this one would be different than every other cover before it because this one would be their first magazine cover generated by artificial intelligence. What would it look like? I started off by getting on a call with the Cosmo team to discuss the creative direction of the cover. We wanted to represent a powerful woman and we decided on an astronaut. Then I got to work and I used Dolly to generate options. Thousands of options, but none of them felt quite right. This one, for example, was too boxy. Can't really tell she's a woman. Okay, that's better, but let's get her walking towards us. Okay, better, but I don't love her pose. Can we get her looking more confident? Each time I adjusted my prompt over and over again, refining it to try to get the right image. And after many, many hours of trying hundreds of prompts, I finally figured out the right one. It was a wide angle shot from below of a female astronaut with an athletic feminine body walking with swagger towards camera on Mars in an infinite universe, comma, synthwave digital art. And drum roll, here's how it turned out. Well, uh, panelists, thank you very, very much. And attendees, uh, thank you for attending. And that's it. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks.